Good morning. Um, welcome again to one of David Kossoff's um, Book of Witness stories in my Lenten series leading up towards Easter. Um, I hope you've enjoyed all the other ones so far. Today's, um, you may have heard of this character because he certainly gets a mention in the Gospels, although we don't get to find out an awful lot about him. So David Kossoff's taken the character of Malchus, who was a civil servant working for the Sanhedrin, who was involved in the arrest. And as the story unfolds, I think you'll uh, pick up bits that you may well be familiar with. So this is Malchus's story. He's a civil servant, and I'm not sure that he's a very nice kind of person, really. So here we go. It would be well, I would suggest, for you to understand fully that in the matter of the recent arrest and death of the Galilean, I had no personal animosity towards him at all. No, none at all. And neither have my colleagues actually towards the ill-advised followers of Jesus, against whom they are at present drafting regulations. You see, we carry out orders. We're servants of the temple with civil authority and influence. Civil servants, if you like. We're bedrock, foundation. The leaders, the spokesmen, the ministers ch uh, change. Governments change. We do not. Ever it was so, ever it will be. Nothing personal. So when my master Caiaphas said some time ago that it would be better for Jesus to die than the whole nation should suffer and be destroyed, he was speaking good sense as he saw it. As a high priest, he has a difficult job, even with our help. Jesus is dead. The thing is done. Soon he will be forgotten. But there is nothing personal. So when Caiaphas makes his statement, I don't think he'd ever met or even seen Jesus. But miracle workers and faith healers and raisers from the dead, well, they can be very disruptive and troublesome. And the Romans are touchy enough on the subject of what my master calls religious matters. Pilate hates all religion, all priests, high priests in particular. He's an impossible man, Pilate. Personally, I have a reason to be grateful to the late Jesus. He attended to um, a head injury of mine that could have been most disfiguring. I'd like to have repaid him in some way, but it was far too late in the day. <laughs> a very apt statement, that. Far too late in the day. And a fact. <laughs> what a day it was, too. I'd have liked to have spared him for at least uh, the flogging, but that was the order of Pilate, a Roman touch. Crucify, but with the scourge whip first. I'm told the Galilean prophesied his death. <laughs> so did I. So did I. I don't have prophetic powers or second sight. No, I have my records. I have on record the exact day that one of his closest friends, one of the so-called Twelve, came here to give him to us, or should I say, to sell him to us? <laughs> oh, it's always a money transaction. It's allowed for. There's a fund, cash unreceited in silver. We took Jesus in the garden at night. A detail of the temple guard, two officers, two men and the informer, he was there to positively identify. We knew that he would be with others, and we wanted no mistakes. I went along, really, just to see that we got our money's worth. Jesus, the leader. We were not interested in the Twelve at all. Our experience in such matters is that once the ringleader is picked up, then the followers simply stop following and they fade away. And he was right. I understand that that's exactly what's happened. They're all of them in hiding. 
The big surprise was that one or two of them were armed, most unexpected. Could have been fatal in my case. When the informer Iscariot had identified by touching, we went forward to make a formal arrest. At that moment, one of the twelve, a huge bearded man, stepped forward with a short sword and very nearly took my ear off. I was covered in blood. <laughs> the blow had clubbed me as well as cut me. I was dazed. I fell to the ground and a guard rushed forward and a, a lot of shouting and then the Galilean's voice speaking quietly. Someone put a bandage around my head, almost holding my ear back in place. I remember thinking to myself, well, Jesus, if you're such a healer, here's one to do. It was almost as though he heard me. He put his two hands up over my ears and he said, it will heal. There will be no pain. Oh, he said other things too about prophecies coming true and why we were all so busy with guards when we could have picked him up in the temple any time. And was he a bandit or some such thing? I don't know. I paid very little attention. I had no pain, but oh, I hate the sight of blood. And I was messy and it was sticky. So I left him to the men who took him to the senior high priest, Annas. Annas, my master's father-in-law, the old man we all call him. <coughs> well, he's the real power behind the throne. He's been high priest, the high priest, for years and years and years. He made all five of his sons high priests too. And when his daughter married his son Caiaphas, he, he became a high priest too. Well, anyway, one of the soldiers took me back home to the palace of Caiaphas. I went to my room and changed my clothes and washed away the blood. I was going to change the bandage too, but I didn't. The report said that Jesus had positively cured people by his laying on of hands. And well, he touched me and certainly that that pain had gone. I felt fine. <laughs> I looked down into the courtyard out of my window. The palace guard had made their usual bonfire. It looked quite cheerful. I saw one of the arrest officers come through the gate on a horse, and so I went down. He told me that the old man would question Jesus, and they would send him across to us, to Caiaphas. The officer told me that as he'd left, the interrogation began, and the prisoner and escort would arrive in about two hours' time. I thanked him, invited him in for a drink. We talked and he was surprised that my wound was giving me no pain, that I seemed unworried by it. He suggested that perhaps the garrison medical officer might look at it. Well, perhaps some stitches. I refused and he didn't insist. After a little while, one of the maidservants came in and told us that one of the twelve was in the courtyard, warming himself at the fire. I asked her how she knew him, and she said she'd been to hear Jesus many times, and the twelve were always with him. She knew them all, apparently, by sight. Is he the informer? I asked. Iscariot? She said no. I, I gathered she had no opinion of our informer. Are you sure? I said. Did you speak to him? She said, yes, I'm sure I did speak to him. He denies it. He says he doesn't know Jesus. She seemed quite upset, so I sent her away. I was amused. <laughs> I seemed, it seemed a foolish action on the fellow's part, whoever he was. I looked out of the window and there were quite a few people round the fire, many of them with their backs to me. <coughs> I was curious and I asked the officer to go down I watched and I saw him speak to a rather big fellow for a moment and then leave him he came in went back to his chair I think the girl's right he said in fact I think it is the man who hit you with the sword but he denies everything there's no blood on him it was dark in the garden and there was a lot of confusion I'm not sure what do you want me to do <coughs> I asked him to look at the man he showed no signs of wanting to run away. He sat hunched, bulky, his back to me. I left it for a while until the officer said that he should go down to meet the arrest detail and I went to find the man. He'd not moved. I went across to him and he stood up. Oh, he topped me by about a head and a half. He saw me and my bandaged head. I, 
I wasn't sure if he recognised me. I asked him his name and his address and his trade. Simon, he said, of Bethsaida, a fisherman. Oh, a Galilean, I said. Like Jesus of Nazareth, a, a troublemaker. We now have him under arrest. I think you're one of his gang, an armed bodyguard. He looked across the top of my head. Jesus and the escort were just coming in. I kept my eyes on the big man's face. The good timing was not accidental. I know my job. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. I don't know, Jesus. I turned and looked at Jesus. He was looking straight back at the big man. A sad look, but nothing to prove he knew him. I turned back to the fisherman and saw an astonishing thing. Tears were pouring down his face. He tried to speak twice. Then he turned and ran out like a madman, straight across the yard and out of the gate. I let him go. If he is one of the twelve and the movement or party or whatever it is starts to get out of hand, we, we shall have him. I shan't charge him with bodily harm or carrying an official's weapon, though. There's no point. You see, the ear, it's quite new. Perfect. Why, there's not even a scar. <laughs>